Friday, February 19th, 8.01 p.m., and I'm going to read Chapter 16 of Part 2 of Liber Eba, The Magic Fire, with considerations of the thurible, the charcoal, and the incense. Into the magic fire all things are cast. It symbolizes the final burning up of all things in Siva Darsana. It is the absolute destruction alike of the magician and the universe. The thurible stands upon a small altar. My altar is of open brasswork, burned thereon in silver or gold. This altar stands in the east, as if to symbolize the identity of hope and annihilation. This brass contains the metals of Jupiter and Venus fused in a homogeneous alloy. This is then symbolical of divine love, and it is open brasswork because this love is not limited in direction or extent, it is not particularized, it is universal. Upon this altar stands the censer proper, it has three legs symbolical of fire, because Shin, the Hebrew letter of fire, has three tongues of flame, and its value three hundred. Its cup is a hemisphere and supported from its edge is a plate pierced with holes. This censer is of silver or gold, because these were called the perfect metals. It is upon perfection that the imperfect is burned. Upon this plate burns a great fire of charcoal impregnated with nitre. This charcoal is, as chemists begin to surmise, the ultimate protean element, absolutely black because it absorbs all light, infusible by the application of any known heat. The lightest of those elements which occur in the solid state in nature, the essential constituent of all known forms of life. It has been treated with nitre, whose potassium has the violet flame of Jupiter, the father of all, whose nitrogen is that inert element which by proper combination becomes a constituent of all the most explosive bodies known, and whose third ingredient is oxygen, the food of fire. This fire is blown upon by the magician. His blaze of destruction has been kindled by his word and by his will. Into this fire he casts the incense, symbolical of prayer, the gross vehicle or image of his aspiration. Owing to the imperfection of this image, we obtain mere smoke instead of perfect combustion, but we cannot use explosives instead of incense because it would not be true. Our prayer is the expression of the lower aspiring to the higher. It is without the clear vision of the higher. It does not understand what the higher wants, and however sweet may be its smell, it is always cloudy. In this smoke illusions arise. We sought the light, and behold, the temple is darkened. In the darkness, this smoke seems to take strange shapes, and we may hear the crying of beasts. The thicker the smoke, the darker grows the universe. We gasp and tremble, beholding what foul and unsubstantial things we have evoked. Yet we cannot do without the incense. Unless our aspiration took form, it could not influence form. This is also the mystery of incarnation. This incense is based upon gum olibanum, the sacrifice of the human will of the heart. This olibanum has been mixed with half its weight of storax, the earthly desires, dark, sweet, and clinging, and this again with half its weight of lignum aloes, which symbolizes Sagittarius the arrow. Note that there are two arrows, the divine shot downward, the human upward. The former is the oil, the latter the incense, or rather the finest part of it. See Liber 418, the fifth ether. And also represents the aspiration itself. It is the arrow that cleaves the rainbow. This arrow is temperance, or art, in the tarot. It is life equally balanced and direct which makes our work possible, yet this life itself must be sacrificed. In the burning up of these things arise in our imagination those terrifying or alluring phantasms which throng the astral plane. This smoke represents the astral plane, which lies between the material and the spiritual. One may now devote a little attention to the consideration of this plane, about which a great deal of nonsense has been written. When a man shuts his eyes and begins to look about him, at first there is nothing but darkness. If he continues trying to penetrate the gloom, a new pair of eyes gradually opens. Some think that these are the eyes of imagination. Those with more experience understand that this truly represents things seen, although those things are themselves totally false. At first the seer will perceive gray gloom. In subsequent experiments, perhaps, figures may appear with whom the seer may converse, and under whose guidance he may travel about. This plane being quite as large and varied as the material universe, one cannot describe it effectively. We must refer the reader to Liber O, and to Equinox 1, 2, pages 295 to 334, and to the Temple of Solomon the King, Book 2, Chapter 4 of the Seer. See also below, Part 3, Chapter 18, page 241, and Appendix 3, Notes for an Astral Atlas, page 499. This astral plane has been described by Homer in the Odyssey. Here are Polyphemus and the Lestrigons, here Calypso and the Sirens. Here too are those things which many have imagined to be the spirits of the dead. If the student wants to take any of these things for truth, he must worship it, since all truth is worshipful. In such a case he is lost. The phantom will have power over him. It will obsess him. As long as an idea is examined, you are free from it. 
There is no harm in man's experimenting with opium smoking or feeding on nuts, but the moment he ceases to examine, to act from habit and without reflection, he is in trouble. We all of us eat too much because people, liveried and obsequious, have always bustled up five times daily with six months' provisions, and it was less trouble to feed and be done with it than to examine the question whether we were hungry. If you cook your own food, you soon find that you don't cook more or less than you want, and health returns. If, however, you go to the other extreme and think of nothing but diet, you are almost sure to acquire that typical form of melancholia in which the patient is convinced that all the world is in league to poison him. Professor Schweinhund has shown that beef causes gout. Professor Nashtikoff proves that milk causes consumption. Sir Ruffin Rotz tells us that old age is brought on by eating cabbage. By and by you reach the state of which Mr. Hereward Carrington makes his proud boast. Your sole food is chocolate, which you chew unceasingly, even in your dreams. Yet no sooner have you taken it into you than you awake to the terrible truth demonstrated by Gutterbach Q. Hosenscheiser, 4th Avenue Grand Rapids, that chocolate is the cause of constipation, and constipation of cancer, and proceed to get it out of you by means of an enema which would frighten a camel into convulsions. A similar madness attacks even real men of science. Nechnikov studied the diseases of the colon until he could see nothing else, and then calmly proposed to cut out everyone's colon, pointing out that a vulture, who has no colon, is a very long-lived bird. As a matter of fact, the longevity of the vulture is due to its twisted neck, and many thoughtful persons propose to experiment on Professor Mechnikov. But the worst of all phantasms are the moral ideas and the religious ideas. Sanity consists in the faculty of adjusting ideas in proper proportion. Anyone who accepts a moral or religious truth without understanding it is only kept out of the asylum because he does not follow it out logically. If one really believed in Christianity, one would go mad if one took the Bible seriously, but to take it seriously one must be already mad. If one really thought that the majority of mankind was doomed to eternal punishment, one would go raving about the world trying to save people. Sleep would not be possible until the horror of the mind left the body exhausted. Otherwise, one must be morally insane. Which of us can sleep if one we love is in danger of mere death? We cannot even see a dog drown without at least interrupting all our business to look on. Who then can live in London and reflect upon the fact that of its seven million souls, all but about a thousand Plymouth Brethren will be damned? Yet the thousand Plymouth Brethren, who are the loudest in proclaiming that they will be the only ones saved, seem to get on very well, thank you. Whether they are hypocrites or morally insane is a matter which we can leave to their own consideration. All these phantoms of whatever nature must be evoked, examined, and mastered. Otherwise, we may find that just when we want it, there is some idea with which we have never dealt and perhaps that idea, springing on us by surprise, and as it were from behind, may strangle us. This is the legend of the sorcerer strangled by the devil.